I haven't been more excited for a game in a long time than I was for Cyberpunk. Going all the way back to 2013 when that first teaser was released, I could not wait to get my hands on it. You have to understand I was maybe more excited than most because this game appeals to all of my favorite design elements. Sci-fi, futuristic, and of course the cyberpunk genre. After years of waiting and multiple delays, the release was more than problematic, with numerous bugs and technical issues especially on the PS4 and Xbox One versions. I'm not going to be discussing these issues though because this is an analysis of the core game and its design, not a review. Suffice it to say, CD Projekt Red should be taken to task for releasing a game that is as big a technical mess as it is, and totally downplaying how unready it was to come out. Nevertheless, I have to say, after 80 hours, Cyberpunk is already one of my favorite games. However, the whole does not equal the sum of its parts, and I'm going to spend the next hour analyzing why, despite not reaching its full potential, Cyberpunk 2077 is a game worth a place in your collection. Cyberpunk definitely wears its influences on its sleeves, and you can track these influences throughout the main design elements of the game. To me, the closest thing to Cyberpunk that works is my all-time favorite, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. The parallels are pretty obvious. Cyberware is augmentations. The projectile launch system is PEPS. Both place heavy emphasis on hacking, specifically remote hacking, as a mechanic. The approach to levels is to give the player the freedom to handle situations in a variety of ways. Both have an awareness system for enemies and they require you to manipulate bodies to keep them out of sight. Both have a store called Time Machine. Both make reference to the dissident practice of Samistat, the overall themes of oppression, corporate warfare and greed, the world design and much more even still. These parallels are not a coincidence, as evidenced by its quest director and official Twitter account explicitly saying the Deus Ex series served as an influence. But Deus Ex is far from the only influence on the game, as parallels can be drawn to the vast open worlds of Grand Theft Auto, the role-playing elements of Fallout, the progression system of Skyrim, the customization system of Alpha Protocol, and the world design of Observer. There are even parallels with movies like Blade Runner and Strange Days. I've concluded that although Cyberpunk borrows heavily from each of these sources and more, the aspects CD Projekt Red tried to emulate do not equal the sources from which it borrowed. In other words, the inspirations do it better. So although I really appreciate a game that features all of these elements from my favorite games and movies, I can't help feeling that those games and movies do it better than Cyberpunk did. Although the mere fact that all of these elements are in here make it a game worth playing. These elements are like pizza toppings. Some people really like pepperoni. Some people really like mushrooms, black olives, Italian sausage, jalapenos. If you're gross, you like pineapple. But if you threw every single ingredient on a pizza, it would be disgusting. Your taste buds would be overwhelmed and tell your brain it tastes like trash. Cyberpunk is like a pizza that CD Projekt Red threw every topping on, figuring, hey, everyone likes at least one of these toppings. However, there's too much here to process, and so it comes out tasting disgusting despite being made up of some really good elements. Let's dive right in. What makes Cyberpunk so good is the sandbox feel. There are so many approaches to almost every objective. Now, not all of these approaches are rewarded equally by the game, but the reward is the satisfaction the player feels after performing some game-breaking techniques. 
You can choose to handle almost every situation in a variety of ways depending on your playstyle. And I for one was pleasantly surprised when I discovered this very early in the game as I thought it would be much more straightforward and linear. I didn't at all expect the game to feature stealth, and as someone who loves stealth gameplay it made the experience all the more enjoyable. When you incorporate all of the quick hacks you are given a wealth of options to tackle every obstacle. Of course you can just kill everything that moves loudly and aggressively. But you can also silently take down all the enemies using an assortment of options like stealth takedowns or quick hacks. You can use the double jump cyberware to jump into the room you need to get to, then distract the lone enemy and take them out quietly. You can use cyber psychosis to turn an enemy and get everyone fighting each other, either as a distraction or just thin the herd and make it easier for you. It reminded me of the hacking a turret and turning it hostile to enemies tactic found in Mankind Divided, Fallout, Prey, Dishonor 2, and Alpha Protocol. The side quest Hacking the Hacker is a great illustration of the sandbox the game gives you to play in. You can just mow everyone down in a psychotic rampage and run straight to the computer and hack it. Or you can use quick hacks to forge a path forward, deactivate all of the security cameras, stealth take down all the enemies in your way, then upload the virus all without anyone being alerted to your presence. Because I chose to upgrade the short circuit quick hack, I was able to basically stealth kill enemies from a distance without anyone knowing what was happening. Because the level design is so good, the sandbox feels like a playground that you can spend hours playing around in. All of the best design elements from my favorite immersive sims like Deus Ex, Prey, and Dishonored 2 are present here, something I never expected. There are so many great examples I want to cover, I'm just going to go rapid fire. You can use your body attribute to force open a door, or find the vent and crawl through if your attribute is not high enough. You can use your technical attribute to get into a door if you otherwise lack authorization. You can use the double jump cyberware to get onto a roof then drop down a hatch. Double jump can also be used to sneak onto areas you are unable to get to if you lack the requisite attribute. And you can use this secret area to silently take down your target without having to engage in a fight. You can use the cyber psychosis quick hack on a guard that is protecting your target to kill the target without even engaging in combat at all. The side job in Inconvenient Killer is a really cool example. You have to assassinate a VIP in a nightclub but he's upstairs in a restricted area. You can use your technical attribute to get into any of the three offices, but mine was not nearly high enough. No problem, because you can distract the guard using a quick hack on a vending machine and sneak through the door. Or you can do it the cooler way and sneak into the vents in the ceiling, then use cyber psychosis on the target to force him to kill himself without alerting any of the guards. This sandbox style approach extends to combat as well. There are so many different ways to approach combat and so many systems running together making it a unique and varied action game as opposed to a cookie cutter first person shooter like Call of Duty. The incorporation of stealth gives you multiple ways to take out enemies without engaging. A classic method is sneaking behind and performing a stealth takedown, but you're not limited to just grabbing enemies and knocking them out. One option is to use short circuit from stealth which allows you to take out an enemy from range. You can even do this with drones as well. Instead of engaging from stealth, you can also remote take over turrets and use them to take enemies out. This reminded me of in other games where you can turn hostile turrets against enemies to do most of the dirty work for you, although here you can actually control the turrets yourself. There are even more cool ways to approach combat due to the variety of mechanics offered. Cyber Psychosis is a quick hack that turns an enemy hostile and psychotic so they will take out enemies or serve as a distraction. It reminded me of AI hacking in the Mass Effect games. The detonate grenade quick hack will force an enemy's grenade to go off, which will damage him and anyone else around him. This can also be incorporated with stealth by doing it out of sight while the enemy is unaware. Of course grenades are a part of the combat just like most first person shooters, but Cyberpunk takes it a step further by allowing you to ricochet grenades off of objects. The first thing I thought of is the similarity to Alpha Protocol, although the mechanic works much more effective here and allows you to take out enemies from behind cover. There are other elements to combat that make it interesting, like the fact that certain enemies have ultra-fast movement capabilities. Enemies will also have access to the same cyberware that you do, pinning you up against those with equal abilities and equipment which makes things all the more challenging. Netrunner hacking adds a layer of anxiety by having an enemy hack you and damage you from cover, and you have to find them and kill them before they deal too much damage. The scanner creates these unique firefights where you can tag enemies through walls and gates and have them light up on your radar leading to these incredibly exciting encounters. 
The game also features destructible cover, which is somewhat unexpected and welcome, because it adds even more spontaneity to the action. One firefight in this game can play out in a multitude of ways. Some areas will have explosive barrels around that you can use to finish off enemies. Melee combat, although somewhat janky, can be satisfying at times, especially when you nail the movesets and blocking. Smart guns are cool additions that when you have the right cyberware will track your target automatically. I will say that the boss fights in the game can feel underwhelming at times, although some are clearly better than others. It does seem like they went for more of the typical bullet sponge type enemies rather than unique and interesting bosses with different movesets or tactics. I also appreciated that you can dismember enemies. Overall the combat is so much fun because of the different ways of approaching it, and the sheer energy and excitement especially when you factor in the frenetic pace and amazing music. Ready or not, here they come! Another totally unexpected but welcome feature is the level design. Part of what makes the game so much fun to play around in is the superb level design for the smaller parts of the game where you have to complete missions. Sometimes the levels are so intricate it helps to plan out your attack before you decide to go about it. The option to take over security systems and gain access to the cameras facilitates this planning because you get an idea of what you're dealing with. There's a sense of verticality to many of the levels which is a huge part of why I love Mankind Divided. The levels in both games are given so much depth that traversal and freedom of movement add yet another element to the game's sandbox feel. My biggest problem with this though is that your exploration and traversal of these levels is not always rewarded. Mankind Divided will give experience boosts just for finding a different path, but aside from experience you are often rewarded with cool loot that you otherwise would not find. These rewards give you an incentive to explore and take the divergent path. A great example of how it doesn't work the same way here is at Riot. I explored the backstage area of the club but there was absolutely nothing back there. No loot, no unique items, and no experience boost. This area does become more useful later in the game, but it does nothing for your exploration and ingenuity now. The discrepancies in the freedom of choice presented are found when comparing Cyberpunk to other games that give you meaningful incentive to play a certain way. I always prefer stealth because I see it as a challenge. It's almost like you're not supposed to do it that way, so it's rewarding when you sneak your way through a level. In Mankind Divided you get experience boosts for going through an area without triggering an alarm or alerting anyone to your presence. Not only lump some boosts at the end of objectives, but you get boosts before that like when you use a stun gun to knock someone out rather than kill them. That's how you incentivize playing a certain way. Here, the incentives do not come close to that level of rewarding. You do get experience for the stealth category and it does help you level up your overall, but my point is that it would be better if there were additional boosts rather than baseline upgrades. There are a few that actually reward you by giving you more money when remaining undetected, but it would be better if it rewarded you every step of the way. Going off of this, the hacking mechanic is way too shallow when compared to Mankind Divided and Fallout. There are panels to hack all over the place, but a successful hack will only reward you with money and components. Of course, these are valuable, but it makes it feel like the mechanic was just tacked on to give the player something else to do. In Mankind Divided and the Fallout games, Hacking will literally open new doors and give you access to areas you might not be able to get to otherwise. Once again, it's all about rewarding your ingenuity and giving you a reason to try and do things in a unique and creative way. I mentioned at the start that Cyberpunk at its core is built in a large, sprawling, dynamic, open world in the same vein as GTA. The problem here is that Los Santos makes Night City feel like a village by comparison. Los Santos is such a vibrant location, packed with cityscapes and inhabitants that are diverse enough to give the feeling of community and culture. There's downtown, which conveys a bustling metropolis, the port, embodying more of a working class feel, Vespucci Beach, South Los Santos, LSIA, Palomino Heights, Vinewood, Del Perro, Rockford Hills, and all of these locations are in Los Santos proper. I haven't even mentioned Blaine County. 
Sandy Shores, Mount Chiladad, Fort Sancudo, the Sonora Desert, Bolingbroke, Bolito Bay. All of these locations are distinct, and the architecture and NPCs that populate each location accentuates these differences. Night City is almost a waste of its sprawling surface area because nearly every square inch feels the same. The city itself is divided into districts, Watson, Haywood, Pacifica, Westbrook, and Santo Domingo, and they try to keep it different by giving each one a unique gang that controls it, so you have the Valentinos, Maelstrom, Tiger Claws, Sixth Street, but other than that there is not much variety in the locations. The Badlands serves as sort of the Blaine County of the map, and it's here you actually sense that you're in a different location. It really contrasts with the sensory overload and sprawling metropolis of downtown Night City in the distance. Pacifica to an extent as well because of the heavy industry the more south you go. What makes this worse is that the locations are given such little characterization. There were a few times it seemed that you were in an actual society rather than just a video game, like when I came across a riot at a police station, but the NPCs don't act differently or erratically the way they do in GTA. A lot of them are just literal copies of each other. There was one time I came across the exact same set of NPCs just a block apart from one another. It even looked like some interesting stuff was going on with the second pair, but you can't even ask about it, and they act like nothing is wrong when you confront them. Contrast this with some of the crazy stuff you see people doing in GTA, or even the conversations you can have with the people or over here in Mankind Divided. People enjoy being religious bigots. They just have to wait for it to become socially acceptable. When the open world is hollow, empty, and uninteresting, there doesn't seem to be a point to even having such a large place to play in. Instead of having intricate systems working together to give the player a sense of realism, it's just a collection of buildings, crowds, and traffic that don't actually amount to a society. The vastness leads to emptiness because the roads are so sparsely populated. Sometimes I would travel for miles on interstates without even encountering another car. I guess it makes more sense in the Badlands because you're on the outskirts of town, but even Blaine County is populated compared to this. Los Santos is much more populated as a whole which adds that realism and speaks to what I said earlier about a system emulating a society, but it's just not the case here. Take the police mechanic too for example. It's embarrassing. You can tell this feature was tacked on at the last minute just to emulate what GTA does. But GTA's cop mechanic is so well thought out and engaging compared to this. Here, you get wanted, and cops will literally spawn right on top of you and try to kill you. The funny thing is, after a set amount of time, if you just kill everything and everyone they send, your wanted level just goes away. It's so stupid. In GTA, someone will witness a crime, and the police will actually take the time to respond to the scene. But if you manage to survive the first wave, they don't just stop coming. They continue to pursue you until you're either dead or you've hidden yourself. Another negative about the open world is how difficult it is to travel around in. The biggest problem is that driving is absolutely disgusting. It's probably the worst open world driving mechanic I've ever experienced. Cars handle like boats, with no traction whatsoever. You go fishtailing around just by slightly moving the analog stick and you have to slam on the brakes just to be able to make a turn. It's slightly better on motorcycles, but not by much. The physics are just awful. Sometimes the car will go up on two wheels for no reason. Not much in the way of control is given to the player when using a vehicle, and I never even bothered with driving in first person, as it's even more disgusting than in third person. When the map is so big that you need to drive long distances to get from one point to another, and the driving mechanic is so unbearable, then you messed up. And fast travel doesn't work the same way as in Fallout or Skyrim where you just pick a discovered location and instantly teleport. Instead you have to use a fast travel point. But sometimes you won't be near one, so you still have to drive to get to one, especially if you're out in the Badlands. Even GTA's fast travel mechanic is easier because you just call a cab which is dispatched to your location in a matter of seconds. Because most of the map feels and plays the same, I think a much more smaller and concentrated map would have better served its functionality. As I said earlier, some of the levels are built in deus ex fashion, but if you're going to make a Los Santos or Capital Wasteland or Ruins of Boston or Skyrim with so much width, you have to fill it with interesting content that makes it worth traveling in. One thing that Cyberpunk absolutely nails is the atmosphere. 
Despite all of this game's shortcomings, the artists and designers who crafted the environments could not have done a better job to capture the mood of a futuristic sci-fi information overload, conspiracy-riddled world that is Night City. All of the great design elements in Deus Ex that I love so much are present here. The lighting, the color palettes, the use of electronics, all of these elements accentuate the fact that the people in this world are slaves to technology, yet at the same time, they are afraid of it. You get the sense from both Cyberpunk and Deus Ex that the surveillance state atmosphere feeds into the division of the respective societies. Nobody trusts one another, and so they watch one another from afar, but this does nothing to keep healthy relationships in society. The environmental storytelling in both games is on another level. There's also a lot of parallels to Observer. A lot of the same design elements can be tracked in both. The over-reliance and ubiquity of technology, the surveillance and paranoia, the constant merging between man and machine. All of these elements give realism to the environment and set the tone perfectly for this world that you play in. I also really appreciated the homages to classic cyberpunk films like Blade Runner and Strange Days. Misty is obviously a nod to Pris and Braindance is very similar to Playback. It's even similar to Lazarsky's tapping in to relive the nightmares of the dead in Observer. The game wears its influences like a badge of honor, and I have to say as a fan of these media, it makes it all the more worthwhile to play. I also have to say that some of the elements of the world building are phenomenal, like Skippy, the talking smart gun that you can befriend who hums Rihanna songs. It highlights the zaniness and humor that the developers used to not take itself too seriously. Bum, bum, be dum, bum, bum, be what, dum, what are you doing? Bum. I'm making the wait more pleasant with a soothing melody. Bum, bum, be dum, bum, bum, be dum, bum. Cyberpunk tries its hand at giving players as many role-playing elements as it can, and some of these elements work while others do not. The RPG elements are definitely the more mixed aspects of the game, and a lot of it feels tacked on. The three aspects tied to progression of your character are attributes, skills, and perks, so let's take each of them in turn. I prefer to keep my character as balanced as possible, rather than specialize in one particular attribute and max it out, as I wanted to be able to use a variety of attributes to be competent enough so as to not miss out on areas of the game. You can use your attributes to get through areas if your attribute is high enough, and doing this will in turn earn you experience toward your overall progression, as well as specialized skills. It's a cycle that works well and serves to improve areas of your game that you've obviously devoted a lot of time to. You earn experience to level up from pretty much everything you do. This is like the progression system in Fallout. Every time you pass a speech check or kill an enemy or hack a terminal, you earn experience to level up. Here, it works basically the same way as you earn experience points from performing quick hacks or using blades to kill an enemy. There are only five attributes to choose from, but it looks like there is a spot for a sixth, which might eventually come in the form of DLC. But since Fallout uses the special system, which has seven attributes, it feels lacking by comparison, especially when the attributes mainly serve as checks rather than make the gameplay different. Skills are more specialized and are broken down by the different areas of the game. You earn experience for specific skills by constantly using that particular skill. This is like the progression system in Skyrim, where in order to get a high enough level in the sneak skill, you have to perform a ton of sneak attacks. Getting your handgun skill up requires using handguns a lot. Getting the engineering skill up requires using your technical ability a lot. Getting athletics up requires using the body attribute. You get the point. What's cool is that certain actions will level up multiple skills, so for example, using Short Circuit from Stealth will level up Quick Hack, Breach, and Stealth. I liked this approach because it feels more organic than just pouring points into an area arbitrarily that you never use. But it did feel like it took a long time to level up skills even after 80 hours of playing. It's also one of the few ways you are rewarded from choosing to employ Stealth. Leveling up your skills will allow you to purchase perks, and this is where the sense of shallowness comes in. The perk system is rather hollow. The perks are just stat boosts that increase damage and resistance and shorten or lengthen timers for hacking or allow you to use certain modifications. 
There are a few perks that give you a reason to pick them because they give you access to mechanics you otherwise would not be able to use, but these are few and far between. Contrast this with the Fallout games, especially New Vegas, where you are actually given cool rewards that affect the gameplay, like the Here and Now perk that instantly levels you up, or the Mysterious Stranger perk where a cloaked figure will appear and take out your enemy. This is how you make perks interesting, but stat boosts are simply too easy and don't give any sense of importance. Instead, perks are essentially armor. Speaking of armor, the game offers a wide variety of clothes and weapons to loot from enemies, earn as rewards, or purchase at a store. The game features legendary items that sometimes will have special properties to them, like the legendary items in Fallout 4. Although I did find often that non-legendary items were sometimes just as, if not more powerful than the legendary ones, except the legendary ones had more mod slots. Every item does have, at the very least, an extrinsic value because everything can be sold for eddies at a shop or a drop point. So even if you were like me and spent the entire game hoarding everything despite only using a handful of items, you can always just sell everything you don't use. Going off of this, I will say that the inventory management just feels disgusting. It's not intuitive to navigate, the menus are cluttered, and the tedium of constantly having to go into and out of the menu from the touchpad wears thin after the first few hours. It's much less user-friendly than the inventory management systems of Fallout or Mankind Divided, but it is a cool feature to disassemble items in your inventory and automatically salvage them for components by default. Contrast this with Mankind Divided where you have to get the micro-assembler augmentation, or Fallout 4 where you have to drop the item into a workbench or on the ground of your settlement and scrap it. You can even invest in one of the few meaningful perks that allows you to retain the mods from weapons of clothes that you disassemble. Cyberware is a form of gear that serves as a special ability or power system. Since cybernetic enhancements are custom in Night City, the game allows you to play around with different enhancements depending on how you choose to build your character. Cyberware is bought from and installed by Ripperdox so it requires a more involved effort than Mankind Divided where you just use your Praxis points to install augmentations at your pleasure. The other problem is that Cyberpunk only lets you install a limited amount of cyberware at any given time, limited by area of the body. So you can only have so many arm enhancements, leg enhancements, etc. Contrast this with Mankind Divided where you can literally install every single augmentation the game has to offer. I guess you could say it places more emphasis on choice by limiting your options, but in a game like this with so many moving parts, I'd rather just have it all. One problem I encountered with regard to loot is that in certain areas of the game, the loot that enemies drop actually cannot be equipped until your level or street cred is high enough. I for one found this mechanic stupid. I hate it when a game penalizes you for taking out a group of high leveled enemies at an early stage in the game or completing a really difficult mission at a low level. It would seem like if you can take down higher level enemies at a lower level, you should be rewarded with the loot that they drop, instead of being forced to grind your level just to be able to use something you've already earned. Contrast this with Fallout 4 where you can find the alien blaster straight away even if your level is really low. Perhaps no single RPG element feels more tacked on than the crafting mechanic. You find crafting specs and use components salvaged from items and hacking to craft the items you want. But with so many items already available, there is little incentive to do so. Plus, the items you craft for modifications are non-cosmetic stat boosts. Contrast this with the crafting system in Fallout 4, where you can completely transform a pipe pistol into a rifle. And by investing in perks, you can craft items that have unique properties to them. Here, the entire mechanic comes off as a last minute addition just to add another role playing element to serve as fans of RPGs. The game does offer an immense customization system to all of your equipment including clothes and weapons. You can get creative with this system by finding legendary items with 4 mod slots and stack modifications to get outrageous boosts like with your armor. You can combine this with a crafting mechanic to craft mods of your choice and ultimately end up with an over 4,000 armor rating. This is probably the most practical use of the crafting system that I've found. Modding weapons and equipment is one of the better aspects because like Fallout 4, you can customize items in a detailed and creative way. I was also reminded of the customization system from Alpha Protocol, which I love by the way. 
You can even customize your cyberware. And I thought this was cool because I for one preferred using quick hacks. So I installed the cyber deck with the most RAM I could get my hands on and tricked it out accordingly. Modifications work in a similar way too, with cyberware having a varied amount of mod slots. But once again, these are stat boosts and cooldown timer reductions. There are also different cyberware that make combat even more fun than it already is, like the electric storm cyberware that detonates automatically when your health is low. A common mechanic in role-playing games is the ability to check a particular skill or attribute and use it to unlock a branching path, earn rewards, or progress a part of the game. Cyberpunk attempts to integrate this check system into its gameplay with mixed results. Sometimes you actually do get rewarded for having a high enough attribute, but most of the time it doesn't matter at all. Fallout 3 and New Vegas feature this mechanic extensively. Maxing out speech will allow you to talk your way into or out of anything. Maxing out medicine will allow you to perform unique tasks like deducing the location of the family or performing life-saving surgery on Caesar. Even your karma can be checked, determining whether companions can join up with you. But these games give you a reason to choose to improve certain skills over others, and there are consequences to neglecting a skill as you will have to think of another way to get what you want. These games serve as illustrations of how to effectively use checks within a game. Here, checks are mostly for opening doors and saving money. Having a high technical or body attribute means being able to open doors and gates allowing you to use a different path to get to where you need to go. Being deficient means you miss out on these paths unless you find another way using the sandbox I've been talking about. You also will be able to jack into computers and panels earning money, experience, and other useful items like components. The way it doesn't always work though is in dialogue options. Most of the checks are just means of avoiding having to pay money to get into a certain area. While it may be worth it to save the money, this just makes it feel tacked on and shallow. Usually it just adds a line of dialogue, but this doesn't serve the game or the story whatsoever. The best example of how it works here is with the going up or down side quest. You have to get your hands on these scandium rods for a client. If your technical attribute is high enough, you will be given the rods without a fight. If you can't convince him, you will have to fight him. Or you can sneak past him and just steal it. It highlights the sandbox approach to playing, but it's one of the few instances I encountered where a dialogue choice actually mattered. An example of where it doesn't work at all would be early in the game when making the arms deal with Royce. Even if you choose not to shoot him, you will have to fight him anyway. Contrast this with the speech checks in any of the Fallout games, like New Vegas, where you can completely avoid combat with the final boss just by convincing him not to fight you. Here, the choice is just an illusion. <laughs> My coming would have saved you. Set your people free in ways they cannot... The story itself is sort of your run-of-the-mill, rise-to-stardom, rags-to-riches narratives that we've seen before. V is a mercenary who gets in deep with partner and friend Jackie Wells and ends up stealing a device called the Relic from the Arasaka Corporation, one of the most powerful in Night City. Things go horribly wrong with Arasaka being murdered by his son with V and Jackie as witnesses, and Jackie is ultimately killed in the aftermath. V is betrayed by his employer but manages to survive due to the relic. Unbeknownst to V, the construct of Johnny Silverhand, a former rock star slash terrorist, is implanted into V's subconscious and is ultimately destroying him from within, giving him a limited amount of time before it overrides his brain and kills him. The rest of the game is about V's quest to save himself from the impending death while also seeking revenge on Arasaka and seeking to become a legend of Night City the way he and Jackie always dreamed of. The story serves the gameplay fairly well here by giving a sense of realism in that the player is put into the shoes of a character trying to work their way up the ranks of the underground scene and become something great. Where the story and gameplay fail to complement each other is in the large number of times you would just be following another character. There were so many instances of me simply following someone in a walk and talk section. It is so unengaging and takes you right out of the experience. It's in the main story and it's in the side quests. There are far too many times I would find myself getting frustrated at the fact that I was just mindlessly walking and listening to exposition. 
it's definitely the worst aspect of the merge between the narrative and the control given to the player. The story touches on themes, some of which are subtle and welcomed, but others are too heavy-handed. The obvious themes are information overload and corporate dominance. The corporations rule with absolute power and influence at the expense of the common man. That's part of the reason V's story works so well. In the beginning, V is at the bottom of the food chain along with Jackie, but the two of them, in a desire to leave their mark and become legends of Night City, descend down a path of mayhem and chaos all to make something for themselves. It's a modern day tragedy we see in real life all too often. The person who, determined to be something important, risks it all and even sells their soul to get there. Another theme is this idea that man ceases to be man when merged with machine. Cyberware is not only common, it is custom. Just like we wear glasses or watches, the people of Night City are cybernetically enhanced. It's like the ship of Theseus thought experiment. Once you replace all of the parts, is it really still the original? or has it become something else entirely? On a personal level, this is definitely the scariest part about technology to me. This idea of transhumanism that we will transcend our humanity in search of bettering ourselves, but at the great cost of losing our humanity altogether. It's one of the most prevalent themes in Deus Ex as well, and I think Cyberpunk does a good job of not bashing the player over the head with it, but still giving them something to think about. In an open world game of this scale, the biggest challenge is making the side quests interesting and varied, so as to not seem boring and repetitive. Unfortunately, most of these side quests and activities leave much to be desired, and it all seems to feel a bit like doing the same thing over and over again. The Cyber Psycho missions are a great example. Once you've done one, you've done them all. Because of the sandbox feel, you can kind of vary the way you fight them, but they all play out exactly the same. Go to the scene where one is spotted, fight them, get a reward. The scanner hustlers are exactly the same too. Just go to a location, kill all the enemies, get a reward. Some of the side quests follow the same procedure. Go somewhere, kill everyone, get a reward. When you're doing this for a few hours to level up, it may not seem that bad. When you're doing it for 40 hours to complete the game, it's tedious. It also doesn't help immersion when you have two conversations going on at the same time when having two different side quests going. Sorry, now, I guess. You know a thing or two about that, you don't you? To the like, ground. how much that solves Good luck ever finding and another earn. job! You want me to clip it for you, don't you? However, to his credit, Cyberpunk does feature some inspired and well written side quests. The quest tree where you meet up with Carrie and get Samurai back together is one of the better branches of side quests because of the story. Carrie is Samurai's lead singer who has become somewhat rudderless since Johnny died, but you can help him get the band back together and meet the vibrant members of the group and bond with Carrie along the way. Pan Am's quests are similar, especially if you picked Nomad like I did. You form a relationship with her and the Aldecaldos and both Pan Am and Carrie can even be romanced if you progress their quest far enough. The river quests are pretty good too. You can also help Johnny rekindle his romance with Rogue by taking her out on a date and letting Johnny take control. But there are two side quests specifically that illustrate the great writing. The first is Dream On, where you help out a couple in politics and uncover a Manchurian candidate-esque plot to put a plant in charge of the government that can be controlled and made to do anything his handlers want. The second is Happy Together, one of the better and interactive side quests. It's a great example of how you can succeed and fail depending on your choices. Barry is a former cop going through a rough time. He quit the force because he had a bad case that his boss made him sweep under the rug, and it was made worse because he lost his friend, Andrew. His fellow cops ask you to check on him as he's holed up in his place. If you do not show an interest in Barry and his story, he will turn up dead in his apartment from suicide. But if you talk to him and exhaust all of the dialogue options, you will discover that Andrew was actually his pet tortoise, and talking to Barry's fellow officers and telling them what happened, his friend Mendez will warm up to him and reveal he too worked on a difficult case where a child killer got off scot-free because he was connected. Barry will let them in and remain unharmed. This is one of the few quests where the stakes are high and it actually matters how you handle it, with real consequences for getting it wrong. Probably the best aspect of the story is the endgame. 
Cyberpunk offers more in terms of diverse, distinct, and satisfying conclusions than any of its contemporaries. There are technically six different endings, and each one provides its own unique conclusion to V's story. These endings are dependent on your choices not only at the final stage, but your decisions leading up to the end made during the course of the game. It's in this way the game actually makes your choices worthwhile and fulfilling. Let's go through each in turn. If you take Hanako's offer, you will storm Arasaka Tower with her help and get the Devil Ending, where Johnny's construct is removed from V, but the process is already irreversible. You are aboard a space station where they are monitoring your progress and making you perform repetitive, mundane tests every day. This part is unsettling, almost like a nightmare where you find yourself trapped in your mind, unable to escape, despite knowing something is wrong. It's what I imagine it's like to be comatose. Your friends will contact you, including Takamura, if you manage to save him earlier in the game. The bottom line is that you can either sign your life away to Arasaka and have your mind placed in Maikoshi until they can figure out a way to save you, or you can choose to return to Earth and live out the rest of your days how you want, knowing that you're going to die. This speaks to the whole theme of freedom, and I personally chose to return because of what I just said. I would rather live in freedom than be trapped indefinitely, waiting for a cure that may never come. If you did all of Rogue's side jobs, you can ask her to help you storm the tower and give control to Johnny. This simulates the earlier mission where you were first introduced to Johnny in the first place. Once you reap Maikoshi, you have the choice to either let Johnny take your body or have his construct removed as per your agreement. Letting Johnny have your body leads to the New Dawn Fades ending which includes a touching moment where Johnny visits V's grave. It's in this ending where one of the most poignant and profound lines of dialogue is uttered, almost in a throwaway line. Johnny's friend is talking about how his grandpa died, and he says, When my grandpa died, I missed him a lot. But now I only miss him sometimes. Mm. Choosing to keep your body will lead to V becoming the legend of Night City. If you did all of Pan Am's side jobs, she, along with the Altacaldos, will help you storm the tower. You have to fight Smasher like in all of the other endings, but this time he will kill Saul in the process. Choosing to keep your body will lead to V and Pan Am riding off together and leaving Night City behind. You could also choose the easy way out and decline to face your fate by just killing yourself. There is one more ending that I discovered on accident and it's what I think is the coolest one because of how secret it is. I got up and walked away during the dialogue prompt at the end, and when I got back there was a different option. For V and Johnny to storm Arasaka Tower alone and go on a suicide mission. As the player, you will have to fight through by yourself, and the layout of the map is even different than in the other iterations. The game even stays true to its sandbox feel by giving you a sense of verticality of freedom in approaching it. The thing about this ending is if you die, you don't get a restart. You just die. Your death is actually canon, and the game will end. Contrast all of this to Deus Ex. In Human Revolution, you get four different options to choose from in the end game, but they only affect the cutscene you see. There's no difference in gameplay. Mankind Divided is even worse. You just get a cutscene depicting a new segment telling you the aftermath of all the choices you made throughout the game. Mass Effect 3 is notorious for its unsatisfying ending, as there you simply make the same human revolution style choice that only affects the cutscene at the end. Fallout 3 and New Vegas similarly have cutscenes that sum up your actions throughout the game. It's in this way Cyberpunk actually rises above its contemporaries by giving distinct conclusions that you experience for yourself on the controller rather than just watching a cutscene. Cyberpunk 2077 is a confused game. It wants to be Deus Ex, Grand Theft Auto, Fallout, Observer, Strange Days, and Blade Runner. It definitely pays great homage to these sources, but the sources themselves do the thing that Cyberpunk is trying to emulate much better than Cyberpunk does. In simpler terms, Cyberpunk tries to be all of these games and movies, but the games and movies do it better. 
the whole does not at all equal the sum of its parts. I appreciate all of the mechanics CD Projekt Red put in here, but it almost seems like they would have been better served by just focusing on a few of these elements rather than throwing everything and the kitchen sink in and seeing what sticks. It's been ridiculed for its performance and undelivered promises, but to me it's still worth a place in your collection. After 80 hours of playing, it quickly became one of my favorites because of the way it gives players the freedom to play it however they see fit. It's part open world, part immersive sim, part narrative driven, and although it may not be the best versions of these elements, there is a good game buried under all of the frustrating design choices. I think with a stable launch and some refinement, Cyberpunk could have received critical acclaim, and could have possibly been hailed as one of the best games ever made. As it stands, Cyberpunk 2077 is worth playing, just like it's worth it to get that supreme style pizza, even if some of the ingredients don't taste good. <laughs>